This is the uh, opening business meeting for Monday, uh, August 27, 2018. Um, we ask that there uh, silence all cell phones at this time and take any personal conversations um, outside of the room. That's you and Carl and David. Um, and then we've also, as the association, have chosen to focus this year 
on the work that we can do to create more welcoming and inclusive schools for all of our students and our staff. Um, we're looking for ways that we can fill in some of the work that the district has already started with um, restorative practices and um, working with our members to help resolve conflicts that arise in any working environment. Um, we're looking at ways that we can help with the recruitment and retention of a workforce that represents the diversity of our student body and um, creating school environments that make all of our students and staff feel welcome and valued and respected. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our mutual interest in securing adequate and stable funding um, and help getting our legislators in Salem to help with that. Um, and I look forward to working with you to find effective ways to communicate to the decision makers about the needs of our students, the successes that we have found here in Beaverton, and finding a permanent solution because we know our students deserve it. So, welcome back and looking forward to a good year. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Next up is Lynn Mitri, and after that will be Lily Dorn. Hello, and uh, welcome back as well. If you push the button, so the light shines. Light shines. It's fancy. Welcome back, everyone, uh, again, and thank you very much uh, for another year, and, and I look forward to it. It's going to be a ton of fun. It was a wonderful to see Hazeldale open up this morning, and I was really surprised how many people were walking and biking, but I shouldn't be surprised. It was absolutely fantastic seeing everybody being so excited about being in their own neighborhood school again. And I'm not echoing anymore, that's awesome. Um, again, uh, thank you. I will be emailing you my annual report for Safe Routes to School. We did have, I reported last time, 15 schools that increased their walking and biking rate and decreased their driving rate. Um, two schools I want to point out is Sexton Mountain and West TV. Um, both have increased, sorry, just within uh, three years, with a, a very active school team, they were able to increase their walk rate by uh, 13 and 14 percent each, and dropped, dropping commensurably. I can't get that word, um, but dropping their their driving rate a ton as well. And everybody's been looking at it. it's, it's it's a lot better to walk to that, those schools. Um, I do want to thank you to our demographer, Robert McCracken, who's worked really hard at making the, the Safe Routes to School walk maps um, for each of the schools, including the high schools, which is new. Um, we, he's interlaced those with both the City of Beaverton and Washington County project maps. So taking a look at how all the projects that the city and the county are doing and how many kids can potentially, sorry, students could be potentially affected by them and looking at can they, can they walk, can they bike, and can, can their routes be better. So I wanted to thank you, Robert, for that. Also, I'd like to thank um, Henry Chan from Community Involvement, who has really has been helping us create a, a flyer to help, to help parents behave better when they're dropping their kids off at school. Parents have a really, sometimes have a hard time doing the right thing in the parking lot. So um, we've developed this wonderful flyer. I'll send it to you as well. It's, uh, it's pretty neat and Henry's done a great job and I want to thank, thank him for that. So thank you again and New Year's gonna be fun. Thanks, Lynn. Next up is uh, Lily Dorn. Hello, hi everyone. Um, thank you, Chair Tim Chuck and uh, Superintendent Grotting. It's nice to meet you all, members of the school board. I'm Lily Dorn, um, and I am the Regional Coalition Manager for the Yes for Affordable Housing campaign, uh, which is working to pass two affordable housing measures this November. Uh, the first measure is the Regional Affordable Housing Bond referred uh, to the ballot from Metro. Um, and then the second is Measure 102, and that's a statewide constitutional amendment uh, that was referred to the ballot by the Oregon Legislature. 
beginning with the regional bond, there is now no neighborhood in our region where the average full-time wage earning renter, a person making $21.75 an hour, can afford a modest two-bedroom rental home. It's impossible to miss the daily struggle for folks to just simply exist with a roof over their heads. We talk about it with our neighbors and our family. We're blown away by the fact that the average one bedroom in the apartment, the average one bedroom apartment in the region rents for over $1,100 a month. We know friends or relatives who are one trip to the emergency room or one lost paycheck from losing their housing forever. The burden of this crisis is falling hardest on the lowest income earners in our community. This includes families, seniors, veterans, people with disabilities. The gap between money coming in and what it costs to make rent feels insurmountable. There's simply no way to make ends meet. We know that kids are more likely to succeed in school if they have a stable place to call home. Without more affordable housing for families, we will leave many of today's generations of kids behind and our graduation rates will only continue to suffer. We know that in order to work, you have to be able to afford a home close to your job. By letting the affordable housing go, uh, problem go unchecked, we're letting skilled workers like nurses, teachers, professional uh, tradespeople, and mid as well as entry level employees, they're forced to live greater distances from the very places they work, all in the name of finding an affordable home. The Regional Affordable Housing Bond Measure, referred by Metro, will approve funding to create affordable housing for low-income families, seniors, veterans, and people with disabilities. These homes will be created in all three counties, Washington, Clackamas, and Multnomah. The total bond is a critical piece of the puzzle. The total bond is $652.8 million over 20 years. The bond will cost an estimated 24 cents per thousand of assessed value, which will cost the average homeowner only $5 a month, or $60 a year. By proposing a region-wide bond rather than a local bond, more communities will contribute to and benefit, it from, benefit from it, lowering the cost to the average homeowner to a little more than a coffee drink a month. It's also important to, to note that the money collected from local homeowners will stay in that community. Each county will decide which housing makes the most sense for their community and will work with local partners to build and preserve it. They will be accountable to making sure the dollars are spent efficiently and effectively with an annual independent audit and oversight committee. The income limit for families is 80% of the median family income, which in 2018 for a family of four was I'm sorry, $65,120 or less. Those making, and so the priority will be given to very low income families, so those making less than 30% median family income, which for a family of four is only $24,000 and $420, so it's, it's really low, or, or, or lower. Um, so many of the people who will be eligible for the new affordable housing options will again include individuals, families of color, people with disabilities, veterans, people at risk of experiencing homelessness. The Regional Affordable Housing Bond will build new affordable homes and renovate existing homes to be used for affordable housing. Approximately 3,900 affordable homes will be created throughout Washington, Multnomah, and Clackamas counties if both measures pass. If only one measure passes, that number decreases to 2,400 units. So you can see there's a mass decrease. Um, I know I'm over time. Should I keep going or is there anything, is there anything that you can provide us in, in writing or anything like that? Definitely, yes. Perfect. That would be great. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, are there any other are there any other folks that would like to participate tonight? All right. We'll move on to our other orders of business and that's the reports. First up is um, comments from our superintendent. Thank you. Um, today was the first day of school. It was exciting. I was able to get out to uh, Greenway, Mountain View, of Oa High School, McKinley and Westview and proud to say that I did not see one crying kindergartner. Maybe some moms coming out the door after they dropped them off, but the kids were happy, excited to go, and, and things were off to a great start. Um, I also just want to mention, uh, you know, as you know, Hazeldale opened on time. Just a big shout out to Deputy Superintendent Mead and all of his staff. That was unbelievable work there, great work as well as uh, congratulations and thanks to our teachers and, and, and whatnot. You know, they're excited. They're wanting to get in the buildings. They, they want everything to be perfect, and, and they were very patient. So, you know, all of our bond work, uh, once I, I, I say, you know, you only have to read in the paper, and uh, you see we're uh, 
many other folks are struggling, but uh, I think the, the board and your vision and uh, to be able to make sure that our money's being spent wisely and all of those projects are going to be completed um, is going to be of great value when we have to go out for our next bond. So thank you for that. But uh, our maintenance, our contractors and everything have just been doing a great job in trying to get those, those uh, schools, projects uh, ready. Uh, talk a little bit about enrollment. As you know, on the 10th of September, we'll have our 10-day drop, and that's really when we realize how many bodies we're going to have in our schools. Um, so we're seeing some fluctuations uh, that we possibly haven't seen before, but we really won't know what those numbers are until the 10th of September. I want to thank our teaching staff. They're being uh, patient. You know, right now we have some, and Sarah's probably heard this, we do have some class sizes that are, that are up a little bit, but just trying to wait and find out exactly what they're going to be. And I know uh, teaching and learning uh, execs are looking at those numbers, our finance department's looking at those numbers, and we will try to balance those numbers out. So uh, we will get you and we will keep you up to date on those numbers. One thing that is um, alarming to us and disturbing, and that is we are down approximately 850 ESL students. Part of that uh, could be, uh, well, I think a major part of it is the way that we are testing students and how the new cutoff scores have been set, especially for our kindergartners. It used to be if we were able to test a kindergartner and they came in at a level four, we were able to count those students for funding. Uh, beginning this year, we are no longer able to count those students for funding. So that is significant, but what's more significant is there's some real worry out there, not only in the district, of Beaverton School District, but other districts, uh, making sure that those students are going to be okay, uh, because we're, you know, there's no, there's nothing, uh, you know, there's no process for monitoring those students. We used to be able to claim those students, and then we would even, when they went to five, being able to monitor those students. So it's going to be, it's going to be really interesting to see uh, how that takes place. And also our new CFO, Yale, and we've been talking about the reduction in the number of poverty students that uh, we are going to see. So that's going to be an impact. Right now we're estimating it. If the numbers don't change, it could be somewhere in the vicinity of $3 million uh, if those numbers don't change. But wanted the uh, board to be aware of that. And um, also I was able to uh, speak with Mike Scott in Hillsboro, and they're seeing some relatively flat and enrollment in Hillsborough at this time, although they won't know that they are starting school uh, a week later than us, but um, that's taking place. And, and uh, one of the things, I don't know if you've had a chance to read uh, the governor's white paper that came out and her strategies, I guess what's really pleasing to me, and uh, thank you to the board, thank you to our staff, teachers, we're doing a lot of the things right now that she is wanting to uh, add resources to uh, everything from high quality uh, preschool to improving class sizes uh, in grades K through three, requiring a 180 day school year, uh, ensuring safe and effective schools, uh, making sure that uh, our students are safe when they come, investing in career and technical education and post-secondary pathways. I think we're, we're really going down that road and we're wanting to, it's not the number of programs we have, it's really the quality of programs that we have. So providing students exploration opportunities, but also career pathways. And uh, supporting world-class teachers and school leaders who reflect their communities. And once again, that talks about uh, creating a quality and diverse workforce, and uh, we're very intent on that. Uh, the Governor's Council, as well as COSA's three work groups, who have members from OEA, OSBA, OSEA, several other organizations, we're all working together, and I think it's the first time we really saw some real collaboration with our groups coming together, so that's exciting. And then also, and I think you're going to hear, I'm not going to steal the thunder, but uh, I know a couple board members have had some experience with what Beaverton is doing regarding their return on investment. Uh, so spending our dollars as wisely as we can, making sure that we're going to measure how those dollars are spent. And uh, uh, Beaverton is a leader not only in the state but across the nation in, in doing that. So 
Um, we're excited about that. Um, as Sarah said, uh, you know, we'll be negotiating a certified contract this year, so we're looking forward to sitting down and uh, with our bargaining unit and uh, having that go. We're also going to be preparing in late spring, uh, looking at middle school boundaries, so we're gathering data right now looking at that we have that to, uh, going on as well as we continue to monitor our elementary catchment areas as far as numbers and looking for trends and bringing that information to you at some time so if we would have to make some elementary boundary adjustments that um, you're made aware of what the data is what we're basing that on if we have to make some decisions to move some of those boundaries so um, and uh, last but not least, and uh, once again, Sarah mentioned this, and I know I've talked with almost every board member here, talking about uh, we're really going to need some revenue reform uh, in light of the PERS increases that the Beaverton School District and every other school district throughout the state is going to see. They're going to see somewhere between 6 and 7% increase in the PERS rates for Beaverton. That's about $23 million over the next biennium. And uh, we definitely do not, do not want that uh, money to come out of classrooms which impact our kids. So uh, really trying to work with our legislature and the governor and making sure that um, we get some revenue reform. I know OSBA, OEA, OSCA, there are several uh, folks. And once again, I think for the first time, I'm seeing a real sense of collaboration and, and going out there and getting some collective impact to make sure our kids aren't harmed here in the Beaverton School District and throughout the league. That's all I have. All right, next up is um, the financial report. Gail. So you all received the preliminary financials for the year ending June 30, 2018. Um, in your packet, uh, we ended the year with an estimated uh, fund balance of 5.9%, which is uh, greater than the board required amount of 5%, but a little less robust than in past years. Part of the reason for that is we budgeted very tightly this, this last year and this current year for the PERS increase that we had that now is going to be carrying over for another two years and getting bigger and then it will happen again in another two years. So our biggest increase um, in expenditures, uh, one of our biggest increases was in uh, benefits. Uh, as Don talked to you, we had, we're, we're still looking for projections for the next um, couple of weeks to see how we're doing and we'll know, um, we'll know more after the 10 day drop. But do you have any questions about Financials, yes. I don't even know if it's a Don question or, or Galen question, but it's about the EDLL numbers. Is that a federal mandate that changed it, or was that a state uh, requirement? It's my understanding it was a state of Oregon mm -hmm. change. I asked that. I asked, called up to Sheikha and asked her if it was a federal. It's basically each state um, comes up with the process of how they identify and. Uh, not only serve but monitor students so that was a change once again it was only at the kindergarten level at the, at the level four and the part of that is is because they believe that some students uh, of our second language students were being identified uh, for that and they really they shouldn't have been labeled as ESL students as second language students so it'll be interesting to see how that how that uh, progresses any other financial questions? Yeah. Uh, mostly just a comment. Mostly welcome, Galen. We're glad that, uh, that to have you here. Um, and uh, as I was reviewing the financials, and you know, I know that we are all bracing ourselves for a, a tight budget year. I wanted to I uh, give a, a shout out to our community for their support for the local option. Um, I know that uh, we are you know, facing head on some really tough choices, and I'm glad that we did not have to make those this year as we. Um, had to cope with not renewing that. So thank you to Chair Timchuk for chairing that committee and to our community for helping us um, face, because I know that class size is a priority for uh, the, both the board and our, our teachers and our community. So thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions? But welcome to you, and we look forward to having you with us every month, and thank you for all the good work you and your department are doing. Appreciate it.
Okay. Next up, we're going to have a report on early release. So if we could have Sue, Jenny, and Maureen. Basically, overall, we're pretty pleased with the results of um, the first year implementation of collaboration time. Um, our biggest surprise was probably the difference between how the principals perceive week one compared to how the staff perceive week one and the impact on their practice. Shouldn't be surprised, but maybe a little bit. Um, but we were pleased that there was broad agreement among principals and staff that collaboration time is making a difference in teacher practice because that was part of the purpose of that and student outcomes. So we know that this time is a tremendous gift um, for our staff. So Ginny is going to talk just a little bit about what teaching and learning will do to help support that. And Maureen will talk a little bit about our, our coming um, processes for this year. Okay, um, teaching and learning is really excited to continue the work um, with early release. Um, on two fronts. First of all, we do a lot with week three. Um, it's our, we call it week three professional development. So all of our TOSAs and our admin work hard to make sure that we're giving options to our teachers during the week three. And I think you've seen some of the data in the packet that shows that it's being very well received um, by our teachers. But also we have a lot of work to do to make sure we're coordinating it with our ELA efforts and our math efforts along with all of our curriculum pieces. So um, with that, we work with our innovation strategists in Future Ready as well to make sure that we're in, um, integrating the um, technology and the digital piece into our curriculum, as well as our executive administrators are working with our principals to make sure that they are delivering really great PD on the week one that has the mixed results. Um, but that is a priority of ours, is to make sure that we're being consistent in curriculum instruction. And what that does for early release is it makes sure that our teachers are working together to be able to develop units, to, to work on how our math with our FOSNO, and I know you've heard a lot about our different math programs for our adoption, so they've been working hard during their collaboration time. Um, and execs are working with principals to make sure that that time is valuable along with the week one that the administrators are also involved with. So both our curriculum instruction people in TNL and our executive administrators are working hard to support principals in this endeavor and really excited about what we see on Wednesdays when we go visit schools. So as you know, it took us several years to get to this stage and so we're really thrilled that the first year went off and we are committed to continue the multidisciplinary approach that we have taken, as you can see at the table here. And our, um, my communications team, Kara and Melissa, are also, we meet on a regular basis, and we plan and support the schools and the principals and the needs that they have. Um, one of the things that you saw in the report, obviously, is the need for the schools to really be telling the story. We can tell the story at the district level, but really parents want to hear about what's happening in their child's classroom. So we're really going to put some focus on that to make sure that the principals are zeroing in on that and making sure that they're communicating very clearly about what is happening in their buildings with this collaboration time. So with that, we'll open it to your questions. Donna. I just had a couple of questions. I, too, was kind of surprised by the difference between the administrators and the staff. So I guess my first question is, is it maybe a communication problem in that maybe the staff, maybe the administrators believe that they're communicating all that they need to to the staff, but the staff really isn't getting it? Or why do you think that there's that big difference? Or have you had a chance to analyze that yet? Well, it's this isn't unique to just early release. We see this, you know, in a lot of different areas. You know, I think most of you know I meet weekly with BEA and we have our communications meetings and these are the kinds of conversations that we have weekly about the perception of management versus the, the perception of staff. 
And so kind of working together to make sure that work is, is collaborative to make sure that it's not top-down, those kinds of things. It's kind of that push-pull a little bit that you probably see in your work and all of you see in your work to some extent. But I, I would say, too, remember these things are self-reported. And so administrators, of course, are going to say they're doing a great job. I'd love to say it's scientific and all of that, but it's self-reported. So I guess my second question is I was also surprised by the high schools because it seems like as it seems like you know, great, fantastic for elementary and middle, and then high school really wasn't as enthusiastic as I thought they would be. So I don't know if we did any analysis with that or not. I was surprised by that. So I can speak to this, but so fill in where okay. I, my gap is. <laughs> okay. So I think some of that comes a little bit around the high school schedules, and that you'll see in that report that. Um, there was some disconnect. There were some staff that wanted to do away with the advisory, that piece. And principals could have done that, but there were some, you know, that wasn't all just a great um, option for people either. In the end, they decided not to do that so they could preserve the options transportation schedule so that they could um, preserve that time for their students. Some of the some of the principals, at least one of the principals checked with the student, their student advisory, and the student said, we value this time, we need this time to be able to access our teachers. They didn't want it gone. Another staff voted against not doing it. So there's a little bit of push-pull on that whole schedule piece where if you have one class, get farther ahead of another class in the same content area. Um, a lot of teachers have figured it out, but there, there's, there is that kind of secondary approach to things as well in that. Thank you. Any other board questions? Leanne? Um, mine are maybe more two observations that one of them you've already honed in on, but really that need to communicate with the community. Um, I was a little disappointed that it was as low because if truly there is, and I believe there is really good things going on for student achievement, we have to get our story out. And I suppose unless a parent feels it's affecting their own personal student, then they're going to weigh that against the difficulty that they feel as a family for that hour and a half of dealing with what, what am I going to do with my child, etc. So just really a, and a strong encouragement about making sure that that story gets out throughout everybody's community um, and as a district as a whole. The second is just a comment as well that I'm looking forward to because it seemed like the data, it's a, you, you, you get all excited about a program, it's been a year and you think, okay, now we're going to know it really worked or it didn't. And it said, you know, we're still figuring this out. So I'm really excited that next year <laughs> we will have the data to say this really was uh, worthwhile and it really has. I mean, there were some anecdotal um, increasing in student achievement, but that really is what should be driving us. And I really look forward to that data, maybe with forecast five, maybe, I don't know what the, um, but that's what I'm looking for. Thanks. So just to reassure you, um, board, we will continue our push at the district level, but we will definitely be pushing the schools to really get that story out. I think that's really important. So the support will still be at the, the district level very much. Any other comments? Anne? Um, I remember when we instituted our release, one of the objectives was to reduce the amount of time that we were using substitutes, and I didn't notice that that actually mm -hmm. had any impact. I was wondering if we had any ideas about what was driving that. Mm -hmm. So, um, Anne, we noticed the same thing, and thinking that it's probably going to take some time teaching and learning, and I should probably let Jenny um, address this, but it, they are really working on delivering PD differently, and so Right, so because of the week three, um, I think you have to, okay. Because of the week three, it's more, it, it's very important that we are not using subs, so that um, teachers are going out during the early release. We're gonna keep that up. We really have reduced it. I, I know it probably doesn't show in the data, but as far as our sub usage in the last two to three years, um, three years ago we were mm -hmm. using so uh, so many more subs. So we have really um, reduced that, I would say, and we're going to continue to next year. We do a lot of our professional development now in August, 
along with our early release day. So there are very few trainings that we pull for um, when they need to have a sub. And a lot of their teams have been doing kind of a push-in type of PD during early release. I was at McKinley last year to watch that. They were doing some work, I think that one was with technology, some really strong pieces and teachers don't have to leave their site. They're, it's just right there. So if we can continue to build on that, I think we'll get better results. Go ahead, Anne. Well, um, and then I just had a, a comment. Um, and it's another one that will be ongoing through the year. You know, we are facing, uh, Superintendent Grotting said $23 million. This is, by my reckoning, close to $9 million program. Um, so I'm going to be really curious how we are even being able to approach those kind of decisions as we go into the coming budget year, particularly since the evidence that we have right now is primarily anecdotal. So it will be a really hard challenge for the board as we go forward to try to figure out how to best prioritize this over so many of the other things that we need to do too. Eric? Yeah, that's kind of similar to my note. I said, do you think this is the most efficient use of professional development time, like results by money spent, which is, I guess, not million. I wasn't paying attention to versus like in tax training and other longer sessions you do when people go to you know, seminars and whatnot. So, um, you know, mine's kind of a business mind, I guess, kind of like Ann, so just thinking like that too. So, but it is nice to see all the good anecdotal data, but you know. Any other comments? I, I, I did have one observation, I, uh, and I, maybe it's just the wording that we use or, um, but again, that messaging so that we're all, so our, our, our community knows and everybody knows. I, I was reading through the tell surveys for the schools that are in my, my, my zone, and I was surprised to see that um, not very many teachers scored very highly that they thought that, that, that they received professional development. And in my mind as a board member, um, that's what I thought we were doing a lot with the, with the early release. What did score much higher in past was they really felt like they had collaboration time. Um, and that is really important because that's so, um, again, as we're making um, choices, um, you know, I know collaboration is one of our pillars and that's, that's really important. I'm just wondering if um, maybe it's just a matter of terminology or, or what you think that, that uh, or maybe it's terminology on my part as a board member, is professional development collaboration time or is working on something considered professional development? I think that um, that is a really good question and if you look at teachers wanting to do collaboration time over professional development, our week three is optional so they have the choice of whether to stay in their building and do collaboration or go to an outside professional development. But as you had mentioned and we feel the same way that that we have TOSAs going to a collaboration team that are delivering professional development. So there's it's skewed on they're both they're both the same in a lot of instances. So I do think it's verbiage. Sometimes they interpret it as PD is something that's delivered to me versus collaboration is something I do. Mm -hmm. So I can't be confused. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate all the information. Um, we're running a little bit ahead of schedule, uh, but the board has been here since 5 o'clock. Um, and we didn't really get too much of a break between um, our last meeting. So what I would like to propose to do is um, go ahead and take our break now, even though it's not 7.45, and come back at 7.20, and then we'll power right on through the rest of the evening. <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody, for getting back on time. We're going to go back uh, now under discussion items, uh, budget committee members, selection process. Carolyn? So as you have in front of you, uh, we have three budget committee positions that are vacant this coming year. So zone three, <coughs> zone five, and zone six. In the past, uh, the process that the budget or that the board has used is to publicize the openings um, and using as many channels and ways as possible. Request a letter of interest and a resume from each candidate. Then each board member interviews the candidates for their zone during the month of October and presents the appointee at the November 26, 2018 school board meeting for board approval. So that's the process that we've used in the past. 
and it's up to you if you want to change it up. I guess this is just a little bit, with this being my first cycle all the way through, um, we, we just kind of make the assumption because uh, these three board positions are also up this next coming year. No? no? It's, it, that these three um, board members have, have, or budget committee members have served their three years. So, so they're on a different cycle. cycle. Yep. They're on a different cycle. So, um, and this this is publicized. Is it our job to, to reach out to the folks that have served before, so we, or we, we publicize it through community involvement. community involvement? But also, you I mean, you want to be talking to your constituents out there and at meetings that you're having and saying, hey, we've got I've got a budget committee um, opening. Would you be interested? They turn in a letter and a resume, and then you go through the, the interview process. Just a point of clarification. So the person that is on the budget committee currently, they can apply again to be on the budget. And in fact, um, after I saw that my budget committee member, so I reached out to mine and just said, did you realize your committee assignment is ending and it'll go out and, and so if you're interested make sure you apply so my question to you is what's the end date and when will you pass those to us do you know oh um we typically will publicize in september um by about october or so you should get the information and then the appointments by november okay so we have about a month a couple mm -hmm. weeks or something okay long. any other questions or comments uh, I just the, my only comment is that, uh, especially for board members, is that if you uh, have people that you think are interested, um, it's and or recruiting generally is. So many of our listening sessions are early this year, so it'd be really uh, generous to them to encourage them to attend early, even though they haven't been appointed to the budget committee. They'll learn the most about what the process is like and see if it's actually a good fit for them or not. Because we do have a listening session in October and one in November, and then we'll have one in the spring. Great. All right. It was just a shock to see, oh my goodness, it's that time again. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next up is uh, school board goals for 2018-19, and this is a discussion. Um, you see I just passed this out to you. Um, we discussed this a little bit at our board work session. I had the big piece of paper out. Um, we did not get to a lot of firm consensus, so I tried the best I could uh, to capture, but this is really a discussion item. So if we have an issue with um, any of these, we can certainly revise and then we can bring it uh, to next month with the consent agenda. But what the, the one change that you will see is we did talk about, instead of advocacy, a community engagement uh, subcommittee and having some work done under community engagement. So is there any discussion on the goals? Go right ahead. Sorry, I mean, I'm just going to read. Tom has a comment. No, I'm still on, like, advocacy. Well, my only comment is that um, I take it where it says advocacy, you mean community engagement. So that under we collaborate, one, that should just, or, or am I reading that wrong? No. Under we collaborate, you wanted to say community engagement. Engagement instead of, I mean, it, 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 didn't, it didn't necessarily mean that it had to be, it just meant that under collaboration, we advocate for these things, but we can certainly change that word to community engagement. Okay. I, I just want to understand what the intent of the community engagement subcommittee is, right? So if it is to include the advocacy work and roll it into community engagement, or if it's to take a different direction and focus solely on community engagement. And that's a question. And that is a question that we as a board did not uh, Totally get to. So ask it again. Yeah. So, so my question is: is 
um, in renaming the committee, right, because it was previously advocacy and now it's community engagement, um, is the idea to solely focus on community engagement or to roll in that advocacy piece as well and do both things? I'm trying to figure out if it's a committee that wears both hats or if it's a committee that just focused on community engagement. And I, I really don't, I'm not pushing any perspective on that. I'm just trying to make sure I understand. And I'm not pushing any perspective either because this is something we own as a board and we did not come to a consensus. So I would say the answer to your question is yes. yes. Okay. Really? Yeah. I, I was going to say I was under the impression that advocacy was a committee and this was part of the advocacy and they'd be doing it. So that's all. Can I just uh, interject? I don't know, maybe I misunderstood something, but I thought we were talking about advocacy as a whole this year and that community engagement was a little bit different, but maybe I misunderstood our discussion. I would like to make a proposal that we kick it back to the subcommittee and have them come up with their goals with some guidance from the board. Uh, but each uh, subcommittee should come back with their proposed goals for the year and those can be vetted at the subcommittee level and then vetted at the board level. And maybe that's something with your input tonight that committee can wrestle with on how much. Do we feel, I, I totally agree, Leanne, that each subcommittee should come up with um, more detailed implementation plans or goals. Um, I'm curious if the board feels like under we collaborate bullet number one, if these sub bullets kind of are the things that we would like to assign generically and gen to this community engagement subcommittee. And then they will absolutely have a lot of work to do to figure out what that means in the bigger sense. These were the, um, the things that are listed there were the things that we said at our work session, but we did not come up with a you know, direct line of who should own it. Um, you know, usually you do in a plan, in a strategic plan, you have this is, this is what our outcome is, this is the strategy, and who owns it. And we didn't get that far with our, but we, I didn't want to put this off any longer because it's important that we have our subcommittees named and we, start, and we start meeting and we start getting them on the calendar. So if I put the uh, cart before the horse, I can, you know, definitely, but I, I did my best to try to uh, finagle what we said at our work session, what we wanted done, but that's de still definitely open to Leanne. I like that those two bullet points uh, are kicked into the community engagement committee, the encourage purposeful inclusive community engagement and identify and promote legislative platform. I like that you I would propose that we kick that to that subcommittee called community engagement or whatever you called it. Um, where is it? Advocacy. No, it's called community engagement. And that you would kick it to that community and then they figure out their goals based off of that. The one thing that I would want to make sure that the committee as a, as a whole, if, if those aren't assigned to a subcommittee, they will likely f slip through the cracks. And one of those is about local government and revenue reform, and I would never want that to slip through the cracks this year. Well, I have a clarifying question with that, because I would hope that we already have a legislative plan for this year, that we're not coming up with one for this year, because we're going into the session, big session. I, Susan, I think we probably do, you know, whether it be through OSBA or whatever, but it's just how we are going to interact with our own you know, when we go to the regional, how we're going to interact. But I did, uh, there is a, a total mistake here under advocacy, under negotiate district budget, and a new, it should be certified contract, not classified. Oh. <laughs> yeah, our superintendent got that. I'm going to just pass down my typos. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I guess, though, I did want to ask a little bit about, my guess about the Committee of the Whole and the local government and rep, um, sometimes those are assigned to Committee of the Whole to make sure people know that we're not letting anybody off the hook um, rather than assigning it to a specific end. So I don't know what the exact reasoning or you know, how we want to, how the chair wants to make sure we all stay engaged in that, but um, I, I do know that that's always a challenge. 
And I would propose at this time, if you folks are okay with it, is uh, that at our October board meeting that we, that the committees have a time to meet in October, September, October, and then we come together at the end of October and sign off on the subcommittee work. Is that reasonable? Yes. Yeah. folks? Is that okay? Okay. I, I lost here. Are we waiting till October to get started? No, we are meeting. We we're now, now in October for for goals for your subcommittee. Okay. Is that mm -hmm. sounds great? I, folks, it's really easy to take on on more than what we we can. Instead, if we just try to stay focused, we we I we took kind of points and um, put them together, and then you'll find on the next page, uh, subcommittee and special assignments. Next page? Or the following page? It's the other way around. Okay. If you... Yeah. It's on the top page. <laughs> any, other, any other questions or comments on subcommittees or goals? So it'll come back to us next month to adopt after I take in all your information and typos. All right, thanks guys. All right. Next up is the uh, school board and the superintendent operating agreement. And Donna? I know I sent you an email, so I'm not sure how you want to handle this, if we should talk about this now or, okay. So I just had a couple of comments, and I could be reading this wrong, because I'm always reading into things. But on the first page of the school board and superintendent operating agreements, if we look at the bottom bullet about board members shall, refer questions, requests for action, or complaints to the superintendent and board chair. I just had a question about requests for action. That seems pretty broad. It's not really defined. So I was thinking, do I have to report something if I get an invitation to volunteer to be, uh, to, um, uh, be a a judge at like Battle of Books or, or something because that's pretty broad. I'm not sure how to narrow that down. That was my first thing. So doesn't include like if my wife asked me to do chores or anything. <laughs> it does. It does. <laughs> yeah. So it's a pretty broad statement. So I'm not sure how to fix that one. And then the second one I had was on the second page, page two, and it's under board chair responsibilities. And this would be the second bullet, respond to community requests or questions if directed to multiple board members. Of course, board spelled wrong. But the deal is, is that in conflict with our handbook? Because the handbook says that if it's directed, if communications are directed to multiple board members, then the person from that zone would take care of it. So I just wanted to make sure, is that a conflict? Those are my two things I wanted to address tonight. So I am um, to just uh, expedite things here. I think that is that the second comment that you made, Don, is a very easy fix. Just that we stay consistent between our board handbook and our. So that's a that's an easy add. Um, as far as your first question about refer questions and requests for actions, or um, this is really up to you folks. If you folks think we need better clarification, I, I was never in any doubt that. Um, I always saw an action was if, if you know we're, we're doing, but if we need better clarification on what an action is from the board, we'll be glad to take that on for definition. Well, if the board agrees that actions is more narrow than how I'm looking at it, that's fine. Just want to make sure that we're talking about it now, so there's a record of it. That's all. What if it's a board actions? I mean, is that what the intent is getting at? Like if somebody's asking for. Board to act on something. When I think anytime that there's a board action, again, we're coming through. You know, we're none of us take actions on our own. We only take an action uh, as a board. Um, an action is not that we respond to an email. An action is not that we attend a school concert. Um, I, I think that um, there there are. It's always good to err on the side of letting staff know or whatever if we are we are doing something in the name uh, of the school board, even if it's a simple, um, you know, 
if, if we're visiting a school for um, a certain reason, but there's there's no one that has to ask for permission or, you know, that's just part of our duties representing our zone and representing um, us as a district that we go to other meetings. But if, again, if um, we need better clarification, is there is there anybody else that thinks we need to define action clearer? I'm just wondering if putting board action would make it more clear as to the intent, because that's the way I've read it when I've looked at it in the past, but if I'm unnecessarily constraining it, you know, like that's not the intent. I, I would suggest that if a particular individual board member is concerned about whether they're in line or not, they just reach out to the chair, mm -hmm. and the chair can answer that question. Okay, case by case. Basically. Case by case. Okay. And, and I would ask on the second one that she raised, I think it's a good point. Sometimes we get um, multiple requests from people and I don't even know that they're in my zone because I don't know them personally. So again, I think that may be where the chair just needs to, uh, you know, just clarify I'm going to respond to this or Tom, did you realize that person is in your zone? Are you interested in responding? Or you? you know, just uh, to me, it does have chain of command, but which helps, but if in doubt, just let's ask the chair. I think that we are, we normally operate like that, but I just want to make sure that the two documents are consistent. So I think you could still um, address it the way, you, what, the way you stated, but as long as it states in both that the idea is you're supposed to handle it if it's in your zone is the primary thing. If you don't know, which we've always operated under that, then it would go to the chair, but I just want it to be consistent is all I'm looking for. I think that's a fair. Okay, we'll make those changes. And then, Susan? And we'll vote on this next uh, school board. It'll be it's just only in the consent. Oh, okay. It's just a discussion yeah. today. Yeah. All right, any other, anything about the superintendent operating? Are we okay with that? Okay. All right. Good discussion. All right, now um, on to action items. First uh, item is the approval of the bond accountability committee. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. 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 Not that I don't doubt myself, but. <laughs> Okay, so the uh, under action items, the approval of the bond accountability committee members, Eric. Yeah, so um, we have two really strong candidates here, Dick Harbert and uh, Jerome Sabayan. I got an opportunity to talk to them um, I think early in August. They both had a huge wealth of experience in construction, management, engineering. Um, a lot of you probably look at their resumes, they uh, just very good skills. And their local stories, Oregon State Engineering. And uh, they live local, which is good. So um, I, I thought they were really awesome candidates. We should vote in to the bond, you know, the Citizen Bond Advisory Committee. Um, they'll, they'll make really good inputs on how to build the projects, and um, you know, and and they're retired, so they have time to really look at the details. So I'm excited about that. So, so I want you guys to hopefully vote them in. And uh, we've already kind of given a pre-warning because we have a meeting on Wednesday. So, <laughs> so, but not the official one. If you guys say yes tonight, I'll call them and say yes. So, so please vote them in. Oh, questions. No, I just wanted to make a motion. Oh. <laughs> I move that we appoint these individuals to three-year terms on the Beaverton School District Capital Construction Bond Citizens Accountability Committee. They are Jerome, Jerome Sabayan and Richard Harbert, Harbert sorry, with terms ending June 30th, 2021. Second. So I'm properly moved and seconded that we uh, approve the to uh, new members to the bond accountability. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Get the order for dinner. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> welcome to our new. All right, uh, next order of business. Um, earlier this evening, um, we had a public hearing on uh, a complaint on our policy AC. Um, and we heard from uh, the complainant, um, uh, Maitri say, and then we also heard from the district staff, and uh, board members asked questions at that time, and at this point it's uh, time to uh, look at that um, complaint and have a discussion on, on public hearing. Okay. 
Is there any discussion on the public hearing? I would just comment that um, when asking the complainant um, what they were hoping for, um, I felt that the district did a, a good job of explaining what was wrong with the resume, what could have made it stronger, not necessarily what was wrong with it, but what would have made it a stronger um, application. Um, and um, so I thought they really uh, went over above and beyond to do that uh, for her and to offer a mock interview and to make suggestions. And I really appreciated that. And I just want to say I thought the district did a good job in explaining what the process was um, as to, you know, the vetting process and how many applications that the schools actually would review. And of course, just like anyone, when you're applying for a job, what you need to do to make yourself stand out. So I thought that was good. Any other discussion? I will say one more thing. It is clear Beaverton is a highly competitive <clears throat> district when you get that many applications for so few positions. It's that was eye opening, I think, to a board member. Any other discussion? Yeah. Um, I have just one last comment, though, is that um, I I appreciated the superintendent's recommendation that we carefully look at uh, our practice. Um, I do not believe that. Um, my professional experience tells me that giving hiring managers 200 resumes is too many. It's about 190 too many. Um, it's a lot to sift through, in particular, it just is. So if there's some additional assistance we can be giving to our staff in order to achieve our goals, um, and as well as some of the contractual issues um, are, are making uh, some of our diversity goals harder. Um, so I appreciate the fact that we're taking a deeper look. Any other discussion? I too will say I, I appreciate that we were able to have um, this public hearing and that you were all able to attend. Thank you very much for making time to for that and I appreciate the time that the staff put in and especially our um, principals. It was the first day of school and to come and be here uh, at five o'clock, um, that was um, great. So I appreciate the, the follow-up on the staff. Is there Leanne? Yeah. I move that the board uphold the decision of the superintendent in regards to the resolution of board policy AC complaint filed July 16th, 2018. I second motion. Okay, it's been properly moved and second that we uphold the superintendent's decision on policy AC. Um, all those, are, is there any discussion? All right. Seeing any discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? So carried. Thank you. All right. Next up is a resolution uh, for affordable housing, bond measure 26-199, and the legislative constitution amendment referral measure 102. Tom, we'll are you. Thank you, Becky. Um, so the board has been approached by the Yes for Affordable Housing campaign about endorsing Measure 26199 and Measure 102. These are two measures that work in tandem to provide more affordable housing in Washington, Multnomah, and Clackamas County. Um, our endorsement would be used in the statewide voters pamphlet um, for Measure 102, which is the constitutional amendment, and in the local voters pamphlet for Measure 26199. Um, earlier we heard from the campaign about the importance of affordable housing for our families, for our community. Um, I think there are a lot of great points made and I don't really uh, want to go over them because I think the connection between affordable housing and student achievement is quite strong. Uh, what I do want to briefly speak to is why it is important that this body provide our endorsement. And I've got three kind of clear points in my head. One is, as elected educational leaders, our endorsement matters. When we endorse a measure, we highlight the issue and its importance for kids. Um, the second is that the reality of tackling large problems like housing is that no one entity can fix these problems on their own. We have to work together on solutions. 
Uh, this is a rare opportunity to work with a coalition across three counties that supports this measure. This includes businesses like Nike, New Seasons, Adidas, Kaiser Permanente, local organizations in Washington County like Home Play Youth Services, Washington County Thrive, Zapano, and local jurisdictions like the Beaverton City Council, which passed a similar resolution. When we add our voice to that of others, we have more leverage to affect positive outcomes for our community. I also want to highlight two of our pillars of learning um, from the strategic plan. Under equity, we provide needed support so every student succeeds. And under collaboration, we partner with our community to educate and serve students. This measure both provides needed support for low-income and homeless families and is an opportunity to collaborate with our broader community to serve students by creating more pathways to housing security. It's also part of the we that we talk about, the need for us as a community to take responsibility for our students. So um, with that, I'll open the discussion. Yes. Uh, Tom, I really appreciate that you brought this forward to the board. Um, it is, I will admit that uh, this resolution is something that I have personally really struggled with. Um, as a school board member, I never expected to become an advocate for affordable housing. Um, I am previously on the record for being one um, during our city meetings with um, the city of Beaverton. Um, that said, I seriously question exactly what it is the board role in this question. Um, I have noticed that even politically active other boards nearby have not chosen to focus solely on a single measure this election. Um, in addition, I believe that there are other measures in this election that potentially have a bigger impact on schools and students, including those for the sales tax as well as the sanctuary state. Um, so I um, have really struggled with whether or not focusing only on this single issue in time to be on, in the voters' pamphlet is the right thing for the original school board to do at this time. So I just kind of lay all those thoughts out for us to consider as a board. Any other discussion? I was going to say I echo Anne and her thought. I, I too have personally endorsed this measure, but I personally think that we need to focus on uh, narrowing it into more uh, revenue reform for the, at the state level um, as a school board, and I agree with Anne in terms of some of the other issues on our ballot that are more impactful right now, um, state sanctuary being one of them. Anybody else? Any? Don? Well, I just wanted to raise my voice in support of the measure because I'm thinking about it from the standpoint of we're always getting data on our homeless students. There's a considerable amount of homeless students, not to mention the trauma that a lot of students have uh, when they, they don't have stable housing. And I think this would go one step further in supporting those, those students by providing their parents with the options that they currently don't, don't have. And I see my role as a school board member and also as a body in you know, trying, trying to more and more, I think, we're being asked to do more and more in the community. And this is just another way for, for us to lend our, our support. Any other discussion? I mean, I know personally, I'll definitely, like, you know, I'd, I'd vote for this. I mean, to me, it's good tax money for me, but, like, I wonder about the ROI, like, the board position, because, like you mentioned, there's a lot of programs we want to help get going that will help our students. And it's unclear to me, like, how many, you know, what, how many students in our district would be impacted. It's hard as hell from the you know, money and how many projects get done. So I'm kind of ambivalent maybe on the board side of the position, but I'm definitely, um, as a, a voter, I'm, I'm definitely for it. So I don't know if that's... Man. Um, I I struggled because, and it, I'm going to echo some of the um, issues that have been raised, because I personally feel very strongly we need more affordable housing in the Beaverton area. And I do see the connection to Beaverton school kids if we get the affordable housing within our, um, our boundaries. But my, my one struggle is I'm holding out for revenue reform and going out to statewide ballots asking a lot of uh, voters. That's what I'm holding out for. It may be another year. I'm hoping our legislature will take care of it, but I'm doubtful. So I, that's where I struggle. You can only ask so many asks, and I want to make sure my ask is big and powerful and is going to really directly impact kids. Um, 
So that's, I just wanted on the record my struggle. I too feel very strongly that we need more afford affordable housing in Beaverton. Um, but I'm, I'm just not sure because of that revenue reform issue that is where I want my big bang for my buck. I'll just uh, add my um, perception. I just spent the good part of the year asking the Beaverton School District voters to back a levy and I accepted that responsibility uh, like all of us did as a board that that is what we were in the business of doing that we needed to get a levy passed to pay for 300 teachers. I knew exactly what I was going out to the voter to ask them to support and that's the kind of business, the role that I thought I had as, as a board member. Um, just fit from a philosophical standpoint, um, I just, I worry about diluting my um, out with the public of what of asking them what to support or not to support and we as individuals can all support whatever we choose we're all individuals but as but as a board um, I feel very strongly that I stay in the things that are my role as a as a, as a school board member um, and um, that's what we did with the levy and that's what we'll continue to do years down the road with the bond um, and there's lots of good work and there's lots of good measures out there um, but this just philosophically I just do not um, think that this is uh, a role that we have as endorsing as an overall school board. I have just one more. Um, you know I in preparation for this meeting I, I took a look at um, a neighboring school board's agenda on how they have handled this item and I was impressed that they have handled it cohesively as part of a, an overall legislative agenda where they had looked at every single one of the measures and they had decided whether they wanted to time their votes in time so that it could be part of the voters pamphlet or not they actually have elected not to um, although they are making stance on most of the measures I think as we uh, turn our information over to the community engagement uh, committee that it's something that really we take a look at timing and uh, breadth and try to decide how to focus our efforts. So I guess that's my last comment on that. Okay. Any other further discussion? Okay. All right. Seeing none, um, we'll move then on to the. Um, oh, <laughs> I already already um, missed. We needed to have a second reading of the school board handbook. So. Thank you very much for not standing up and showing. So we need a um, any discussion on the second reading of the. I did not see any issues this this time around. Thank you. <laughs> any other discussion? Okay. All right. Stands is so red. Um, it looks like it's under an action item. Do I need to? Agenda? No, it's it's an it's an action item, but it's just the the second reading. So yeah. I move that we approve the school board handbook as in our board book. Okay, yeah, second. All right, it's been properly moved and second that we uh, accept the second reading of the school board handbook. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so moved. Ann? Oh. Uh, anything you want to, on the consent agenda? This is Leanne's job. <laughs> <laughs> it's all yours. <laughs> it's like the, you know, the veteran board member's job. <laughs> <It's all laughs> to get us out of here on time. I move that we approve the consent agenda. <laughs> second. You can properly move and second that we accept the consent agenda. Although, is any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Um, next is board board member comments. Susan. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> My one and only comment is I was very excited last week to go through the Virginia Garcia Clinic. Um, it's really exciting to see. Uh, Beautiful um, uh, 
clinic that is accessible to so much of our community, and I'm very excited to um, advocate for people in schools to start utilizing the, the nice clinic. Dental, mental health, physical health, it was, it was great. Donna? I wanted to echo that. I went for the tour as well. It's a fabulous facility, all brand spanking new, so it's quite exciting. But I also wanted to say I had my fifth annual principal's brunch. Fifth one. And everyone showed up except for two, because Angela was, uh, of course, trying to get Hazeldale open, and Stacy had a conflict. But everyone came, so it was very exciting. We had a wonderful, just enjoyable time, and I was happy to welcome three new principals in my zone. And who are those three principals? Uh, there's, there's Ashley, and I've forgotten Ashley's last name. She's from Kinnaman. There's, sorry? Hudson. Thank you, Hudson. Wendy, who was the former vice principal at Loa, who's now the principal at Mountain View. Thank you. And then there's Matt Castile, who's now the principal at Aloha High School. Did I get it wrong? No, you're good. Okay. All right, all right. Sorry. I'm just bad with names. What can I say? Anyway, it was it was really really good. We had a really good time. We talked about what we did during the summer, and they have nice positive things to say about the union. So I just want to let you know. All right. Any other Tom? I uh, had the opportunity to go down to Sacramento on Thursday and Friday last week to attend the GFOA school budgeting training, and um, I didn't realize when I was headed down there that I was actually headed back to Beaverton because about half of the slides they used, they were referencing our budget and our strategic plan and our multi-year finance plan, and they knew folks in our district like on a first name basis, Claire, and Gail, and Carl. Um, it was it was quite amazing, and in conversations with the other um, folks, it was a lot of CFOs basically. Um, I learned how much good work is going on in the district here to make our budget successful, and was so impressed by the work. Um, in comparison with, to what's going on at the national level, it's not often we as board members have a chance to kind of look outside of our own district and look bigger and wider and see what's going on and. Um, I just guess I would end by saying I'm very proud to be a part of this district and I'm very proud of the work that our uh, finance staff have been doing and I think it's going to bode really well in the difficult times coming ahead because listening to some other districts that are facing similar issues, we are much better prepared. Yeah, that's nice to hear. Any other board, Any other board members? Um, I will just... I will just say that uh, I too got to go through the Virginia Garcia uh, tour today. They're doing a wonderful job, and I know they're doing a really good job of reaching out to, to all of us uh, to let us see the facility that's available to our students. And uh, also, um, this last month, I had a chance to meet with two new principals in um, my zone and welcome them to the to the district. And on. Uh, Thursday had an opportunity to be at Mountainside and see them get ready for year number two and welcome their third, third class there and um, it's, it's just hard to believe that that school is only two years old. It's, it's, really, it's really going well. And just my own just personal observations of driving around the district, um, so many of our grounds look great and um, I just want to acknowledge uh, Carl, you and your staff with a shorter summer with all the things that you had to do with getting Hazeldale uh, opened, um, all of the projects. I mean, your, your staff really, really um, big kudos for the, I know it was in overdrive, but um, job job well done, but the district, district looks good. So um, anyway, so superintendent, any last remarks? No, eight o'clock, I don't know who yeah. won the poll, but uh, you did well on your first meeting. <laughs> I, I want to thank you all for being patient because I went out of order and I didn't. So thank you all for being very patient with me in my first meeting. I, I appreciate it. So we are adjourned.